Hey guys, yet again, I'm back. So chapter 10. My name is Radek. I'm your TA for Economics 1 BO3 Microeconomics. So what are we going to be doing in chapter 10? We're going to be doing externalities. Um, so positive externalities, negative externalities, Pigovian taxes. What else? Coase theorem. We're going to be doing Coase theorem. going to be going over utility, utilitarianism and why some of these things don't work. So why don't we start off with externalities? So an externality, or a transaction spillover, is a cost or a benefit not transmitted through prices, incurred by a party who did not agree to the action causing the cost or benefit. A benefit, in this case, is called a positive externality, or external benefit, while a cost is a negative externality, or an external cost. The example that you should have had in class is a a tree in your neighbor's backyard. The positive externality of the tree is shade in the summer. Suppose you like shade. A negative externality would be the leaves in the fall and the mess that the leaves cause in your backyard. So in these cases, in a competitive market, prices do not reflect the full cost or benefit of producing or consuming products or services. Producers and consumers may either not bear all of the cost or not reap all of the benefits of the economic activity and too much or too little of a good will be produced or consumed in terms of overall cost and benefits to society. For example, manufacturing that causes air pollution imposes costs on the whole of society, while fireproofing homes improves fire safety for neighbors. If there exist external costs such as pollution, the good will be overproduced by a competitive market, as the producer does not take into account the external cost when producing the good. If there are external benefits, such as in areas of education or public safety, too little of the good will be produced by private markets, as producers and buyers do not take into account the external benefits to others. Here, overall, cost and benefits society is defined as the sum of economic benefits and the cost for all parties involved. So, when we think about a company that is producing steel, suppose, and one of the byproducts is air pollution, the price of the steel does not actually reflect the cost because one thing that we do not take into account is the cost to society of poor air quality. So while we're talking about pollution, why don't we look at pollution from driving? Here we see in diagram A, here we see the price of gasoline without taking into account the negative effect or negative externality caused by pollution from your car. So if there is a negative effect that is not accounted for, the price is clearly too low and needs to be higher to account for this unaccounted cost. With negative externalities, the social cost exceeds the private cost. The private cost is the cost of us buying gas. Um, and so the optimal quant quantity and price will change. The quantity is less and the price will be higher, as seen in diagram B. So, in the same way a tax shifts the supply curve up, a negative externality shifts the supply curve up, and we see the same area as a debt weight loss. Now, this is a little different from what your book shows, but it works the same way, the way I've calculated it. The marginal private cost is less than the marginal uh, societal cost by the amount of the external cost, i.e. the cost of air pollution. This is represented by the vertical distance between the two supply curves. It is assumed that there are no external benefits of air pollution, um, so that societal benefit equals individual benefit. If these costs are not accounted for, it is assumed that the consumer is underpaying and the product is being overproduced or overpurchased in excess. So diagram C. So internalizing an externality, what does that mean? This is a mechanism that gives buyers and sellers a distinct, uh, a distinctive, uh, a disincentive to overconsume a product that is produced in uh, with a negative externality. It usually takes uh, it takes the form of a tax, and these taxes are called Pigovian taxes. And this was mentioned in one of my earlier videos. So why don't we see what a Pigovian tax is? A Pigovian tax is a tax levied on a market activity that generates negative externalities. The tax is intended to correct the market outcome. In the presence of negative externalities, the, the, the social cost of a market activity is not covered by the private cost of that said activity. In such a case, the market outcome is not efficient and may lead to overconsumption of a product. A Pigovian tax 
is equal to the negative externality is thought to correct the market outcome back to an efficient level. One difficulty with Pigovian taxes is calculating what level of tax will counterbalance the negative externality. Political factors such as lobbying of government by polluters may also tend to reduce the level of tax levied, which will tend to reduce the mitigating effect of the tax. Lobbying of the government by special interests who calculate the negative utility of the externality higher than others may also tend to increase the level of the tax levied, which will tend to lead to a suboptimal level of production. So if the tax is too low, we're still overproducing. If the tax is too high, we are underproducing. So those are the two problems of lobbying. So why don't we move on to a happier portion, like positive externalities. In this case, the marginal cost is less than the marginal societal benefit, or to say it the other way around, the benefit exceeds the cost. Vacations are an example, where the one-time cost, or <laughs> vacations, vaccinations are an example, where the one-time cost of immunization will far exceed the public cost later down the road for treatment. So say, that, okay, so say you're getting immunized for something like, like bird flu, and the cost of the vaccine is $150. So we have the one-time initial cost of $150, but say that you were to get sick and treatment would cost the government, OIP, uh, $150,000 later down the road. So the one-time cost far exceeds the long-term benefit. So graphically, the societal benefit is the, the vertical distance between the demand curves. With a positive externality, the demand curve shifts left. These products should be subsidized by a negative Pagovian tax, or simply just subsidized. Um, goods that create positive externalities and that are not subsidized are usually underproduced than what is sociably desirable. A subsidy is a form of financial assistance paid to the business or economic sector. Most subsidies are made by the government to producers um, or distributors in an industry to prevent the decline of that industry, or an increase in the price of its product or simply to encourage it to hire more labor. In standard supply and demand curve diagrams, a subsidy will shift either the demand curve up or the supply curve down. A subsidy that increases the production will tend to result in a lower price, while a subsidy that increases demand will tend to result in an increase in price. Both cases result in a new economic equilibrium. So, why don't we move on to the Coase theorem? So the Coase, theorem, the Coase theorem describes the economic efficiency of an economic allocation or outcome in the presence of externalities. The theorem states that if trade in an, uh, if trade in an externality is possible and there are no transaction costs, bargaining will lead to an efficient outcome regardless of the initial allocation of property rights. In practice, obstacles to bargaining or poorly defined property rights can prevent uh, caution bargaining. So first, why don't we describe what is utility and utilitarian thought. I think I've gone through utility before, but definitely not utilitarian thought, so why don't we go through both. Utility is a measure of relative satisfaction. In other words, it is a term referring to the total satisfaction received by consumer from consuming a good or service. Given this measure, one may speak meaningfully of increasing or decreasing utility, and thereby explain economic behavior in terms of attempts to increase one's utility. Utility is often modeled to be effective by consumption of various goods and services, possessions of wealth, and spending of leisure time. So, since we know utility is a measure of satisfaction, why don't we move on to utilitarianism? Now, it is an ethical theory holding that the proper course of action is one that maximizes overall utility of society, so the overall joy or satisfaction of society. Utilitarianism is a very simple idea that people should behave in a way that their choices should be that which bring the greatest long-run happiness to society as a whole. Blah, blah, blah. So, why don't I give an example? All right, an example is, uh, is you're buying a big stereo for your car. You love it. You drive around and everyone looks at, looks at you. And it brings you, let's say, a thousand utility. But everyone else sees you as a nuisance. And each person in your neighborhood gets negative 100 utility from you. And suppose that there's 20 people in your community. So the aggregate disutility that you are causing 
is negative 2,000. So you're getting 1,000 utility. Your neighbors are getting negative 2,000 disutility. So by the utilitarian school of thinking, you should not buy that stereo because it brings everyone negative utility as a whole and it makes your society unhappy. So with that in mind, we can move to the Coase Theorem. The Coase Theorem is, str is strongly based on utilitarian thought. Basically, if, if something creates a negative externality but produces more utility than the negative externality produces disutility, then it is allowable. So this sounds complicated. I assume it sounds complicated because I wrote it and it sounds complicated to me. So let me try to deconstruct this in a way that even I can understand. So and another example, your neighbor has a lawnmower. It's an old smoky thing and every time he uses it, you get annoyed by the noise and the smell. Your neighbor is quite content because he is rather cheap and frankly, the mower works. So the mower brings him more utility than disutility. But to you, it brings you more disutility than utility. In the presence of bargaining, if you can offer him a sum of money to buy a new mower, and if your neighbor accepts the amount of money which is greater than the benefit of keeping the mower, then the private parties have bargained over the allocation of resources to solve the problem of negative externality producing more. So basically, two private parties have bargained to solve the problem of a negative externality. But wait, what if you offer him uh, too little? He will keep the mower. If he derives more utility from the mower than the sum you are willing to offer, it's still efficient because Coase theorem is based on utility maximization. If he counter offers with a price then it is higher than you are willing to agree, then it is also efficient because that amount has more util uh, utilitous value than the this utility of the lawnmower. Still confused? All right. Suppose for every one dollar you derive one util of satisfaction, and suppose that your neighbor's lawnmower causes you a hundred disutility. Now suppose that your neighbor derives two hundred utility from the broken lawnmower, and just as you, derives one util for every one dollar. Now you'll be willing to offer him a maximum of a hundred dollars for his lawnmower. But remember, he derives 200 utility from the lawnmower, and he also derives one util of satisfaction from every one dollar. So he would not accept because he needs at least 200 utility worth of money, therefore $200. So why is this efficient still? Because his mower causes you 100 disutility, it brings him 200 utility, so the aggregate utility is a positive 100. So his utility of 200 minus your disutility of 100 still creates a positive 100 utility in society. But now suppose that the lawnmower causes you 1,000 disutility, you hate this thing, and it still brings him 200 utility. Now you can offer him anything over $200 and it is still efficient because you will maximize utility in society by up to 800 utility. But you know what? We don't always have a happy ending. The Coase theorem applies only when the interested parties have no trouble reaching and enforcing an agreement. Sometimes the parties fail to solve an, external, an externality problem because of transaction costs. Transa transaction costs can be things like contracts or search time. The problem usually is that parties try to hold out for a better deal to maximize their surplus or utility. Reaching an, efficient bar uh, uh, reaching an efficient bargain is usually especially difficult when a lot of parties are involved. Suppose you have a strike, and the more time goes by, the more there are lost wages. It is in everyone's best interest to bargain and agree the sooner the better. But because everyone tries to maximize surplus, the cost increases more with every day that goes by than that they do not agree. When private, parties bar uh, when private party bargaining collapses, the government can intervene. So, 